Okay, it's my pleasure to introduce the Ludwig von Mises Memorial Lecture, sponsored by Yusuf Almoed. Uh, Murray Sabrin, who has been a very good friend of mine for, I won't say how long, but it's been decades, many decades, um, had a BA in history, geography, and social studies education from Hunter College, uh, an MA in social studies education from Lehman College, and a PhD in economic geography from Rutgers University. Um, Murray is, is, is one of only two individuals who, had, who have had the honor of having Murray Rothbard serve as a member of, the, of, of, the, of his dissertation committee. Dr. Sabrin joined the faculty of the Anus, School, Anus Field School of Business of Ramapo College of New Jersey in 1995 and retired in July, on July 1st, 2020 as professor of finance. The board of trustees awarded Dr. Sabrin emeritus status for his scholarship and professional contributions during its 35-year career. In 2021, Dr. Sabrin published two books, Universal Medical Care, From Conception to End of Life, The Case for a Single-Payer System, and secondly, Navigating the Boom-Bust Cycle, an Entrepreneur's Survival Guide. He is also author of Tax-Free 2000, The Rebirth of American Liberty, a blueprint on how to create a tax-free America in the 21st century. Well, we're waiting, Murray. And, 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 why the, and the second book, uh, in, in, uh, published in the same year, and why the Federal Reserve sucks. It causes inflation, recessions, bubbles, and enriches the 1%. In November 20, 2022, Dr. Sabin published Finance of Healthcare, Wellness and Innovative Approaches to Employee Medical Insurance. His autobiography, From Immigrant to Public Intellectual, An American Story, was also released in November 2022. Uh, Mar uh, Dr. Sabin will address us today on the forgotten Austrian Peter F. Drucker and the welfare state. Please welcome Dr. Sabin. Thanks, Joe. I appreciate that, that introduction. I just want slight correction. I started teaching in 1985 uh, to 2020. Uh, 2020 makes that 35 years. Anyway, uh, thanks to uh, the sponsor of today's uh, lecture, uh, Youssef Alumed. And uh, Joe, uh, if you don't know, was my roommate in South Royalton. So we go back a long way. And um, I won't tell you the details of that, uh, that uh, encounter. Anyway, I also want to thank a big thank you to Lou Rockwell, because he had the vision to found the Mises Institute in 1982. And the Institute has enriched countless students uh, over the past uh, 40 some odd years. And I was fortunate to be one of them, not only as a student of Austrian economics, but using the ideas of Mises, Rothbard, Hayek, Rockwell, Salerno, and the list goes on and on, in teaching of the financial history of the United States, which is a course I can tell you students loved it, because they got to understand how the financial system evolved, why we have boom bust cycles, and um, where we are headed. Uh, I have, uh, sir, I know of course Tom DiLorenzo, who, whose work on Hamilton and Lincoln was, uh, I integrated that in the course as well, and students really had their eyes opened about Hamilton and uh, Lincoln and uh, what they did to the country to set us on a road of st to statism. I have, uh, I had three observations before I begin, now I have a fourth one. Uh, it seems that the Institute has more restrooms than I-75 has rest areas. <laughs> I can tell you that from driving on I-75 several times, and uh, you really have to have a strong bladder to stay on I-75. <laughs> also, I would have brought my teleprompter here, but several years ago, Joe Biden borrowed it, and the staff has refused to return it. <laughs> so, um, also, uh, as we were driving uh, from Florida to the Institute, um, a lot of billboards, and you get to learn a lot about the local culture by the billboards that are there. And there was one that really struck me. It said, rockets and mortars. And I'm saying to myself, one customer of that company must be Walter Block and his private army. <laughs> General Walter Block has a nice ring to it. I think that the other thing that I find interesting living now in Florida after so many years in the Northeast is the difference in hospitality between the Northeast and the South. And uh, to give you an example, when you drive into New Jersey, on the turnpike, it says, welcome to New Jersey. And it also says, you haven't seen it, it's in small print. Um, 
the Bill of Rights is above the pay grade of Governor Murphy. <laughs> That's what it says. You have to really look hard for it. But when you drive into Georgia and you drive into Alabama, it says, welcome to Georgia, welcome to Alabama. Have you enough ammunition? <laughs> so uh, it's good to be in a place where they respect your Second Amendment rights. It wasn't always that way, by the way, if you know the history of uh, gun control in the United States. Anyway, it is fitting that I deliver the Mises Memorial Lecture, the 75th anniversary of human action. I, too, am celebrating a 75th anniversary this year. I arrived in America on August 6, 1949, with my parents and older brother from West Germany, where I was born nine months after the publication of Economics in One Lesson by Henry Hazlitt. I'm trying to still figure that out, but um, I'll get into that in a moment. Although I did not formally study Austrian economics as an undergraduate or graduate student, I have been channeling Austrian economics since I was a youngster. Let me provide several examples. For the students here, when color TV was introduced to the market in the mid-1950s, it was about $1,000 for a color TV. That's about ten, twelve thousand dollars $12,000 in today's purchasing power. I was in elementary school, and I said, $1,000. I think my father was making $3 an hour at the time. And I said, why would anyone buy that? Unless, of course, you're really wealthy. Because I, 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 instinctively, I said, as production increases of a new product, prices will come down. In other words, good deflation. So I was channeling Austrian economics at age 10 or whatever it was back in the mid-50s. Fast forward to um, a few years later when I started teaching in New York City schools in 1968 as a social studies teacher. And I remember distinctly teaching a, sixth, a bunch of sixth graders in the inner city of uh, the Bronx how goods go from raw materials to final consumption, never having read anything about Austrian economics. I forgot the context of the lesson I was teaching, but I just went through it on the board. You go from raw materials to fabrication to wholesale to retail. So instinctively, or just common sense-wise, how do goods come to the market? They have to be pr produced somewhere. And I'm, I realized I must have been channeling I Pencil by Leonard Reed at the time, and uh, Hayek's Prices and Production. A few years later, this is really interesting, the summer of 1972, okay, the summer before I, I entered uh, Rutgers full time, my wife and I were vacationing in Spain when we went to a street market in Barcelona, not, from, not far from an upscale retailer, El Corte Inglés. I saw a tan leather jacket at one of the vendor stalls and asked the woman the price of the leather jacket, and she told me it's much more expensive at El Corte Inglés. I told her, I'm not in the department store where it's air conditioned, the sun is not beating on us, there's no cobblestone uh, streets to walk on. And so she said, she's not in an agreement. Sure, you're not in a very fancy retailer. So that was my first uh, concept of subjective value. That although it's the same exact good, the location of it makes a difference in how the consumer perceives that good, okay? Uh, yesterday, Michael Oliver, I just added this in uh, after Michael Oliver spoke about sending a letter to Murray Rothbard. Uh, after I read Man, Economy, and State in uh, February of 1974, I too sent them a letter because um, I was studying in the geography department at Rutgers, and um, I owe Murray a great uh, debt of gratitude because there on page 711 of Man, Economy, and State, of my, the edition that I have, my dissertation topic jumped out at me. Uh, where he wrote, um, new money enters the economy and diffuses through the country. Well, we know diffusion theory is applicable in so many different disciplines, most recently epidemiology. And so I wrote him a letter saying, "Would you?" because Rutgers allowed you to have one outside member of the university to be on your dissertation committee. So I wrote him a letter. It must have been in March of 74. And I'm waiting for a reply. No reply is coming. Michael got one in, what, three days or four days? <laughs> I'm waiting, and I'm waiting, and I'm waiting, and no reply. And I said, the guy must be so busy. What, what's, what he wants, why does he want to deal with our Rutgers graduate student from, in geography, no less? So then I was at Rutgers one day, and I said, I can't take it anymore. i got to go see him in Polytech. So I drove from New Brunswick to Polytech in downtown Brooklyn, and I'm waiting outside his office. And I expected, having read his uh, op-ed in 1971 about that, uh, Nixon betraying the country with wage price controls. I expected someone at least six foot tall, and in comes this short, 
fairly rotund gentleman into his office, and I said, Professor Rothbard? He said, yes. So he, uh, he took me to his class of micro, microeconomics, and it was just a superb uh, lecture on microeconomics. And um, I said, I read your Man, Economy, and State, and I'm going to do a, a thesis on the geography of inflation. He was excited like you couldn't believe, like we were friends for 40 years. And so um, uh, next thing I know, I got an invitation to the South Royalton situation. Well, what does a PhD in economic geography, what skill set does a PhD in economic geography have that no Austrian economist has? Okay, I'll let you mull that. I can locate Vienna and Auburn on a world map blindfolded. That's what I can do. Okay. It's no mean feat, I'll tell you that. In addition, I just uh, Googled um, uh, the distance between Vienna and outside of Munich, where I was born, 250 miles. So I think I was destined to study Austrian economics. I lived near Vienna. I understood that deflation is natural and um, Subjective value was a concept that I understood. So studying geography and social studies education as an undergraduate, um, the impetus for that was I received a wonderful bar mitzvah gift, okay? an atlas of the world, a leather-bound atlas of the world. And I just devoured it, studying every region possible. And then when I went to, um, then when I took the geography courses, and I studied every region of the world except Asia and India. The courses at the undergraduate and graduate level were based upon region. There was North America, South America, Europe, Africa. And the most difficult course was the geography of the Soviet Union. Trying to memorize Russian regions was a real challenge. And the thing that stood out in that course was, there's always one course, I think, that gives you a factoid that carries you forever. In the textbook, it said the Soviet Union, at that time, in the mid-60s, had 20,000 years of coal reserves. Think about that, 20,000 years of coal reserves. And it has everything else, every mineral under the sun. Uh, yet the Soviet Union was a basket case. So although geography was fascinating, it didn't give me the answer of why the topog not topography, but the human geography looked the way it did. And so that's what, what interested me. The next year, I took a course in political geography. That was even more fascinating, because it helps explain a lot of geopolitics in, in uh, the world. And uh, in, in that course, we learned about the Heartland Theory. Anybody familiar with the Heartland Theory? Okay. It was, it was posited by um, uh, a British geographer, Halford Mackinder, in 1904. And his theory was that who controls the world island, the Heartland, the world island is China and Russia, then you have the Heartland, and then you have the Outer Rim. If you take a, a, a world map and draw a line between the Korean Peninsula, Southeast Asia, the Middle East, and Ukraine, what do you get? The perimeter of the heartland. The heartland theory basically explains US foreign policy since the end of World War II, containing the Russian bear and China. That's what the heartland theory posits. And of course, the US policy has been intervening in those places in the world. Okay. Uh, several years ago, as Joe mentioned, I was on sabbatical to investigate the Federal Reserve and the business cycle, which turned into my 2019 book, Why the Federal Reserve Sucks, It Causes Inflation, Recession, Bubbles, and Enriches the 1%. Last month, a financial site published a study about how much net worth it takes to be in the 1%. To my surprise, I learned my wife and I are one percenters. My next book will be, Why the Federal Reserve is the Greatest Thing Since Sliced Bread. <laughs> a love letter to Greenspan, Bernanke, Yellen, and Powell. <laughs> My topic today is the forgotten Austrian Peter Drucker and the welfare state, and I should add it, the nonprofit sector. I became interested in Drucker's writings when I read his no December 1990, 1991 Wall Street Journal column, It Profits Us to Strengthen Nonprofits. I shall discuss his contributions to the literature of nonprofits and the welfare state shortly. If you're unfamiliar with Peter Drucker and his writings, a, a, brief, a brief introduction, I'll give you a sense of his enormous accomplishments during his lifetime. Drucker was born in Vienna in 1909 and died in California in 2005 at the age of 95. 
CNBC produced an hour documentary about his lifelong contributions to the practice of management, where his former students and clients showed their deep affection, reverence, and appreciation for his insights and advice. Drucker was the author of at least three dozen books on a wide range of topics from political history to management to entrepreneurship to nonprofits to Japanese art and other subjects. In other words, Drucker has written more books than both Joe Biden and Donald Trump have read. <laughs> this is not, as Joe, uh, Biden would say, there's no joke. Joe Biden <laughs> has spent most of his time reading classified documents, and Trump has been spending his time reading uh, indictments and lawsuits. I, recently, I met a gentleman who went to law school with Biden. And uh, the, the feedback was, uh, Joe was nowhere to be found in the uh, law library at Syracuse University. Okay. Drucker's parents, Adolf, an economist, an attorney, and, and his mother, Carolyn, who studied medicine, a rarity for a woman in Austria, Austria at the time, held weekly dinner parties where many Vietnamese intellectuals stopped by. I could not find any reference to Mrs. or Hayek having been guests at one of the weekly dinners. That doesn't mean they weren't there. I just couldn't find any yet, which is surprising because Mises and Hayek were doing research at the Business Cycle Institute Mises founded in 1926 and was an economist at the uh, Vienna Ch uh, Chamber of Commerce. In his memoir, Mises described himself as the country's economist. In addition, Mises' monumental 1922 book, Socialism, should have accorded him an invitation to be one of Drucker's uh, dinners. A frequent guest, however, was Joseph Schumpeter, uh, who had a major impact on Drucker's thinking about the world. Drucker, according to his biographer, Jack Beatty, received a first-class education at home, listening to the diverse intellectual discourse on the post-World War I period. Beatty's biography is a wonderful tribute to Drucker, and I urge you to take time to read about a fellow Austrian's early years and Drucker's commitment after the rise of Nazism to battle totalitarianism throughout his lifetime. Now, here's the real interesting thing. Mises was born in 1881, Drucker in 1909, and yet that very similar early years. Let me give you an example. Drucker left Vienna in the 1920s, which he admitted he hated because of the collapse of civilization, the inflation. He just hated it. So he went to Hamburg, Germany, when he was 17 years old, where he worked as a clerk trainee for an export firm. He enrolled at Hamburg University in the law faculty to appease his father, who was an attorney. Because Drucker worked during the day and could not attend classes because none were held in the evening for the year and a half he was enrolled there. At Hamburg, he did not attend a single class. He spent his time in the Hamburg City Library reading in German, English, and French. Drucker's skill as a writer was evident when he was in the fourth grade. He knew he wanted to be a writer because he was good at it, and he began his uh, writing career in the late 1920s. And this is, this is priceless. In September 1929, and we know what happened a month later, he wrote that the stock market could only go up. <laughs> a few weeks later, the stock market crashed, and that was the last financial prediction he ever made. <laughs> As physicist Neil Bohr stated, prediction is hard, especially about the future. <laughs> he soon moved, moved to Frankfurt and enrolled in law school courses at the university. He became a financial writer at on Frankfurt's largest newspaper, where he was soon promoted to senior editor at age 20. Think of this, senior editor at age 20. Why wasn't there anybody older to take the position? World War I decimated the, pop, the generation before Drucker. That's why Austrians, libertarians hate and despise war. It is incredibly devastating, not only from the economic point of view, but from the personal hum human point of view. Drucker was not a uh, German citizen and was ineligible to take exam in the law, for the law doctorate. He crammed to take an exam and earned a doctorate in public law and international relations. In 1933, Drucker emigrated to England after Hitler took power in January 1933 because he explains in his documentary and his writings he had read Mein Kampf. The Nazi regime would be inhospitable to writers like Drucker, who had already penned critiques of totalitarianism. After finding a job as a security analyst for an insurance company, he eventually married a woman from Austria whom he reconnected with in London. 
Drucker attended Keynes' seminar at Cambridge and, quote, discovered he was not an economist. <laughs> Drucker said, suddenly realized that Keynes and all the brilliant economic students in the room were interested in the behavior of commodities while I was interested in the behavior of people. Sounds like an advocate of human action. As his biographer points out, quote, his interest in people would lead him to the study of management, for, for which Drucker is all about people. It would lead to his career as a management consultant. Beattie points out, as for Keynesian economics, notably its advice to, for governments to spend their way of depressions, Drucker observed, in other words, government spending uh, during the depression was like a doctor telling the you that you have an inoperable liver cancer, but it will be cured if you go to bed with a beautiful 17-year-old. There were some interesting things uh, that I can go into, but I, I won't. After spending four years in England, Drucker and his wife left for America in 1937, which he found vibrant and forward-looking even during the Great Depression. He, co he compared Europe in the 20s and 30s as looking backward, trying to reestablish the old culture, the old republic, and he said it wasn't going to happen. And in America, he found that people were forward-looking. In 1939, his first book was published, The End of Economic Man, The Origins of Totalitarianism. Remember, he's not even 30 years old yet. The purpose of the book, he writes in his forward, is to strengthen the world to maintain freedom against the threat of its abandonment in favor of totalitarianism. Sounds like it could be written today. Writing, um, okay, um, I would love to have David Gordon. David, you have an assignment for today. Do a book review of, of uh, Drucker's uh, analysis of the origin of totalitarianism. Drucker asserts in the introduction that this is the first book to explain the origin of totalitarianism. I don't know if that's correct. We'd have our uh, resident uh, guru, David Gordon, come up with that. The interesting thing about his book is that there are no footnotes and does not list any of Mises' works in the appendix, which is really surprising because it was written throughout the 30s. So he had to know about socialism. He had to know about... Uh, the Free and Prosperous Commonwealth, and other Mises writings. So to ignore Mises, and I think I know the reason why, which I have a quote from Drucker about that. So let's sum up the parallel lives of Drucker and Mises. Both published their first book about the same age. M Mises was 31 when The Theory of Money and Credit was published in 1912, and Drucker was almost 30 years when The End of Economic Man was published in 1939. Drucker left Germany in 1933, and Mises left Austria a year later to teach in Switzerland. Drucker arrived in America in 1937, and Mises wrote when he, uh, why he left Switzerland, I left the institute, quote, I left the institute because I could no longer face living in a country that considered my presence a political liability and a danger to its security. Mises arrived in America on August 2nd, 1940, exactly nine years before I did. He began teaching at NYU in 1945. Drucker joined the NYU faculty uh, five years later, when the university created a graduate school of business management, where he taught until 1971, and Mises, as we know, retired in 1969. Yet I have found few references uh, to his fellow Austrian Ludwig von Mises in his most important works. In fact, the only direct contact I could find between Drucker and Mises is on page 50 of Mises' mem uh, Drucker's memoir, and this is fascinating. There's a PhD dissertation topic right in here, or a master's thesis in here, on page 50 of his um, memoir. It's called Adventures of a Bystander. And I want to read this to you. Uh, Drucker talks about this woman, Annette. He doesn't give her last name. He, des he describes her as a tall, beautiful, elegantly dressed woman, young woman. And this is what he, he says. She was the first woman in Austria to go into economics. That was the time around 1906. And this is interesting when the Austrian School of Economics is dominated worldwide. I leave that to Joe Salerno to figure out if that was true. But this is Drucker's view. The great men of the school, Visa, Bambarberg, and Filopovic, were still alive and teaching. And the students were brilliant. Ludwig von Mises was Anne Annette's classmate. But Annette, by common consent, was the superstar, equally gifted in theory and in mathematical analysis. Even Mises who was no feminist and did not suffer from undue modesty, admitted her superiority. This is, this is the really interesting part. Years later, in the 1950s, when Mises was old 
and very famous, he and I were colleagues at New York University. We did not see much of each other, which is really fascinating when you think about it. Mises considered me a renegade from the true economics faith, left paren, for good reason, right paren. But one day, going down in the elevator together, he turned to me and said, quote, you knew Annadette, didn't you? If she had been a man and encouraged to go on, she would have been the greatest economist since Ricardo. There's a PhD dissertation somewhere there. Who is this woman, Annette, uh, who herself had a very interesting, um, let's say, sexual orientation, OK? And uh, she, according to Drucker, was really one of the superstars in uh, Vienna in economics. Okay. Uh, I will keep on searching. I've contacted Drucker archives to see if there was any other uh, communication between Mises and, and uh, Drucker. and doesn't seem to be any. Okay. So let me see where I'm fine. Okay. However, I did find one quote from Drucker about Mises, which is, I think explains a lot and why he probably ignored a lot, of, a lot of his work. Quote, he, Mises, was the most depressing person I ever saw. That is an incredible statement to somebody who was an intellectual giant. In the same article, Rothbard uh, observed Mises was, quote, a joy and inspiration. Mises, Mrs. Mises is quoted in the same article, quote, he wasn't gentle, he had a will of iron, his mind a steel blade, and he could be unbelievably stubborn. Was Drucker assessment of Mises accurate. Mrs. Mises, writing in the forward to Mises, to Ludwig von Mises' memoir, quote, never before had he written such candid, harsh, devastating remarks and observations about economic conditions. Universities, the professors, and well-known pers public personalities in Austria and Germany, never before had he expressed such undisguised despair about the coming decline of Western civilization. That speaks volumes about Mises' outlook of what he saw going on in Europe at the time. And uh, Drucker, I think, being the uh, optimist of the, of the period, uh, just felt that Mises was just too depressing, too uh, uh, pessimistic about the future. And um, in, in the memoir, Mrs. Mises uh, asserted that uh, years later, as his personal situation improved, Mises sort of uh, tempered his, um, his negative outlook. Okay. Uh, now, now to the main topic of my lecture, Peter Drucker and the Welfare State. According to Joseph uh, Massiorello, a longtime friend and colleague of Peter Drucker, who served as the Horton Professor of Management at the Peter F. Drucker and Masatoshi Ito Graduate School of Management at Claremont <coughs> University, quote, from his very first book in 1939 through his latest book in 2004, Drucker had pursued the enormous topic, how do we create a society that functions? His answer, we must create institutions, organizations that perform, which in turn leads to the question, how does one create organizations that perform? And then, how does one develop managers that, who create organizations that perform? In other words, Drucker was an institutionalist. He saw the institution as the vehicle to create a better society. According to Drucker, quote, the old communities, family, village, parish, and so on, have all but disappeared in the knowledge society. Drucker was the first one to, to uh, ascertain in the 1960s uh, census that the knowledge society was going to expand dramatically as opposed to the old industrial society in America. Uh, the place has been taken, has likely been taken up by the new unit of so social organization, the organization where community membership has been seen as fate, organization membership is voluntary. That's why one of his first books was about General Motors and how General Motors was a community where workers were able to see, uh, obtain status and have meaning and, um, and goals for their work. Okay. Uh, Drucker points out uh, in the knowledge society, he, he recognized would be the future of the global economy required new institutions for people to realize their potential. Drucker asks an obvious question about the knowledge society of who takes care of social tasks. Okay. He points out that two answers have emerged in the century regarding, and they, he considers them both wrong. According to Drucker, quote, the majority answer goes back to 100 years in the 1880s when Bismarck's Germany took the first faltering steps toward the welfare state. The answer, the problem of the social sector can and should must be solved by government. 
it is still probably the answer for most people, except especially in the developed countries of the West, even though most people probably no longer fully believe it. This could be written today. What is the thrust in Washington? If there's a problem, we've got to have a government program. A government program at the federal level, the state level, the local level. Drucker continues, modern government, especially since World War II, has become a huge welfare bureaucracy everywhere. I think Austrians would agree with that wholeheartedly. And the bulk of the budget in every developed country today is in, devoted to entitlements. that is payment for all kinds of social services. Okay. To give you some idea of the size of the welfare state in America, and very few people have done this, but there was a chart published the other day of the federal government's income statement for February. Total receipts, $271 billion. That's a lot of money collected by the federal government. However, the outlays were more than double that, $567 billion. So the federal government is collecting half of what it's spending. That's for February. Uh, we know revenue increases in April, June, and uh, September when estimated payments and tax returns are filed. Now, let's look what money is spent on. Okay? And this is an area that uh, Austrians, I think, have done a great job and some um, other free market economists. What, what are the expenditures of the federal government? And I would contend, if you look at the categories, it's all, virtually all welfare spending virtually all welfare spending. Social Security, $121 billion. Most people don't consider Social Security welfare, but in fact it is. The money you put in is already spent. It's not your 401k, it's not your IRA. It's not, the government just gives you a promise to pay you. Income Security, $90 billion. Health, $76 billion. Medicare, $73 billion. Remember, these are monthly numbers, not annual numbers. These are monthly numbers. Net interest, $67 billion. National Defense 65, Veterans Benefits, Education, Transportation, and others. In other words, the government takes money from the taxpayers, it goes through the welfare bureaucracies and the other agencies of the federal government, and comes back to the taxpayer at a deep discount. So is this a way to run a government? And um, what Drucker says is that the government should not be providing these services, they should be basically paying for them as a paymaster. In other words, he considers the GI Bill the quintessential excellent government program where the government is not providing the institutions of education but allowing the beneficiaries to use their tax dollars to pay for education. So for Drucker, that is his, his um, uh, paradigm. Okay. Now, here's some Drucker quotes which are, which are really wonderful and problematic that he's written and spoken about over the years. And I, I find them fascinating. And the first one, every Austrian would agree with, every libertarian would agree with, and good fiscal conservatives. The wisdom of government can on, only exist in textbooks. If you take that statement and apply it, you don't want the government doing anything except what's authorized in Article I, Section 8 of the Constitution. And he, then he wrote, none of the U.S. government programs of the last 40 years in which they try to tackle a social program through government action has produced significant results. But independent nonprofit agencies have had impressive results. I'm going to skip some of these quotes, even though there's so much. Here's the quote that I think is really interesting. The nanny state, a lovely English term, is a total failure. We can all agree with that. Government everywhere in the United States, the United Kingdom, Germany, and the former Soviet Union have proved unable to run community and society. But the counter theory, this is really interesting, that preaches a return to pre-World War I government has also not proved out. That theory was first formulated in 1944 in Friedrich Hayek, The Road to Serfdom, and, the culmin and, cu and that culminated in neoconservatism. I don't know why he doesn't call it classical liberal, because that's what it should be called, not neoconservatism. He continues, despite its ascendancy in the 1980s, despite Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, the nanny state has not shrunk. That's for sure. Just look at the budget over the last 40 some odd years. On the contrary, it has grown ever faster. 
and the new Republican majority, so he's writing this in either late 94 or early 95, is soon, to, uh, is soon going to find out neither maintaining or curtailing the nanny state is acceptable to the public. He is right. When conservatives say we have to have a safety net, a government social safety net, they've lost the argument. All they're debating now is how large it should grow, how fast it should grow. When I saw this quote, I said, Drucker should be in the Austrian camp 100%. When Drucker was invited to speak to the employees of the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare in 1969, by the way, a department was created by President Eisenhower in the 1950s, the first, uh, in 69, the first year of President Nixon's first term, the president introduced him with these words, quote, Peter Drucker says that modern government can only do two things well, wage war and inflate the currency. It's the aim of my administration to prove Mr. Drucker wrong. <laughs> Talk about irony of ironies, right? <laughs> two years later, we get white wage and price controls, the abandonment of the uh, classical gold standard, and of course, um, uh, the continued war in Vietnam. So uh, even uh, President Nixon uh, did not fulfill his promise to the American people. Uh, yet in 1995, Drucker wrote a piece about reinventing government. It was the rage with Al Gore as vice president. They're going to reinvent government, downsize it. If you remember 1996 State of the Union address, Bill Clinton said the era of big government is over. That was a joke. Uh, it has grown enormously since then. And um, what, the way Drucker looks at government, and it's throughout his writings, he doesn't look at government as the provider of services, but as the conductor, as he calls it. He wants the government to conduct society. Where he come, came up with that idea is really remarkable. He wrote, and we need government as a, as a central institution that expresses the commonwealth and the common vision and enables each organization to make its own best contribution to society and citizens while expressing common beliefs and common values. We need strong, okay. if you take blood pressure medicine, take it now. We need strong, effective governments in the international sphere so they can make sacrifices of sovereignty, sacrifices of sovereignty needed to give us working supranational institutions for world society and world economy. That sounds like it comes out of what? The World Economic Forum, doesn't it? So when I read this, immediately came to me, whose common vision? Whose common values? Is it Bernie Sanders' common value, values? Is it uh, Joe Biden's values? Is it Donald Trump's values? Who's a protectionist and an easy money guy? Is it Ron Paul's values? Okay. Whose values is he talking about? He continues sort of a dig to libertarians. We do not face a withering, way of the a withering away of the state. On the contrary, we need a vigorous, strong, and very active government. Okay. I read that, and I, um, he, he, keeps, he keeps on disappointing me, Drucker, after I read his 1991 uh, Wall Street Journal article. Okay. So he called his proposal reprivatization, where, the gov where we shrink the welfare bureaucracies but we maintain the concept of government as the, not the doer, but the orchestra leader, okay? Now, what does he write about in his 1991 essay, which got me started on the journey of understanding Drucker and his approach to a whole bunch of subjects? Here's how he starts his art article. Government has proved incompetent at solving social problems, okay? We know that. We know that. Virtually every success we have scored has been achieved by nonprofits. And he lists all, some of the nonprofits that have done incredible work at a fraction of the cost of what government agencies would do it. The nonprofit, set, uh, the nonprofit sector spent far less for results than government spends for failures. That's just a, an, an objective analysis. He concludes with these observations. Bureaucracy's hostility to the nonprofits is not too different from the bureaucratic hostilities to markets and private enterprise in the former communist countries. Let's applaud that. That's a great statement. The success of the nonprofits undermines the bureaucracy's power and denies its ideology. Worse, the bureaucracy cannot admit that the nonprofits succeed where governments fail. 
What is needed, therefore, is a public policy that establishes the nonprofits as the country's first line of attack on social problems. Okay? In other words, he called for nonprofitization, a total reevaluation and a restructuring of the social sector. Okay? He recognized that we have the private sector that produces the goods and services that people want. We have the government to do some modest activities. So what was Drucker's solution to getting the uh, government agencies or government bureaucracies out of the equation? He says, we could boost the finances of the nonprofits by providing a $1.10 tax deduction for every dollar contributed to a nonprofit. In my Tax-Free 2000 book, I went a step further and said, if we really want to get the nonprofits as the first as the sector to deliver the goods, the services that people want, we should do a, do a, a dollar tax credit. In other words, instead of your dollar going to Washington, it goes to your favorite nonprofit, the Mises Institute, okay? Um, this would mean that every nonprofit would have to raise its money from the individuals. So what do I recommend as far as this? Certainly, it's not going to be with Biden or Trump. They would announce that within one year, no nonprofit will get one penny of tax dollars. All of the money would have to be raised through voluntary contributions from individuals, corporations, foundations. Okay? Um, and the money is there. We know there's, uh, what, $140 trillion of net worth in the United States, something like that. And... Uh, I went to the uh, website of the uh, public, let's see, where is it right here? Uh, the National Public uh, Philanthrop Philanthropy Trust, and it has data on how much money is available. And I would make the point that if um, the Bill and Belinda Gates Foundation want to do something great for the American people, in other words, low-income people who have, don't have access to medical care, and save the U, uh, U.S. taxpayers about a trillion dollars a year to, to wipe out Medicaid. Um, you can do what I did when I was invited 20 years ago to be a founding trustee. Uh, you see, they're already applauding in Auburn, okay? Uh, and you create a nonprofit. So I was invited by the founder to do that. Okay. So uh, to give you some idea of the re uh, reaction is uh, several years ago, 15, 20 years ago, I attended a healthcare conference in New Jersey, and one of the speakers was, of the, uh, was chairman of the New Jersey Senate Health Committee, where one of the speakers was a founder of a nonprofit health center in New Jersey. And um, after he spoke, I went over to him and I said, we could save New Jersey taxpayers a bundle of money if we create nonprofit health centers through tax credits for New Jersey. But New Jersey has a very strange income tax. It's not called the income tax, it's called the property tax relief fund. So all those dollars are earmarked for education dollars to go to uh, local communities. So I said, he said he would investigate this concept of nonprofits providing health care to low income folks who are, don't have Medicaid. So I, uh, what was the conclusion? Expecting, expecting politicians to do the right thing is like expecting a nymphomaniac to behave herself on a submarine. Um, it's true. It's true. They can't help themselves. They just can't help themselves. I've debated them as running for office in New Jersey. Both Republicans and Democrats, all they want to do is maintain the status quo. Drucker's view of government is a paradox. On the one hand, he says government does, does only two things well. Uh, with money and a wage war, print money and wage war. But he wants the government to be the conductor of society. In his 1995 essay, he wrote, the megastate that the century built is bankrupt. I think everyone would agree with that. Morally as well as financially, it has not delivered. But, and here's the real paradox, but its successor cannot be small government. How he reaches that conclusion from his premise is, is really an inconsistency. There are far too many tasks domestically and internationally. We need effective government, and, what, and that is what voters of the world are, uh, are, count, are clamoring for. In the final analysis, Drucker's legacy as the world's preeminent management theorist and practitioner is secure. 
However, if he had braced praxeology and Mises' insights about how to best organize society, in other words, through voluntary action, his legacy as a champion of liberty, which he claimed to have set out to be in his first book, The End of Economic Man, would undoubtedly have earned them a place in the pantheon of classical liberal intellectuals. Thank you. <laughs>